In this video, I'm going to talk about a few circular motion example problems related to an amusement park ride called the rotor, or there are other rides that go by different names, but it's the same kind of concept. You get inside of a cylinder, that cylinder starts to spin around faster and faster, and once it reaches a certain speed, the floor that you were standing on drops below you and you're more or less stuck to the wall as it spins around. So let's talk about the physics of what's going on, which allows you to essentially stick on the wall as it spins around. Well, when you get inside of this cylinder, you stand up against the wall or right next to the wall, and you know there's a gravitational force pulling down on you and the floor is gonna be pushing back up with a normal force, the same size as the gravitational force. Well, this thing is at rest and it's not spinning and you are at rest. Well, the ride slowly starts to spin and you're gonna move around in a circular path as the whole thing starts to spin. Um, and once it starts spinning and you have some uh, tangential velocity at any given instant, like down here, you're moving to the right. At this instant, you're moving up. At this is instant, from this perspective, you're moving to the left. Your body, remember, wants to follow a straight line path at a constant speed unless there's a net force on you. And so when you're on this ride, if your body wants to go straight, you're continually running into the wall up against your back. And so the wall will continually be pushing out with a normal force on you. So as this thing is spinning, the wall the whole time will be pushing with the normal force towards the center of the circular path that you're following. That's going to be the sum of the forces on you when you're involved in the circular motion. Well, the fun happens when the floor gets dropped um, and you more or less stick there. But if the floor goes away, the normal force can't counteract the force of gravity, and so that force has to be friction. Well, why would there be a frictional force on you uh, when you're moving around like this, when you feel a normal force and a gravitational force? Well, it's because you feel a normal force. Remember that we can calculate the size of the frictional force that any object feels um, if we know the coefficient of friction between the two surfaces in contact. In this case, it's gonna be the material of your clothes that you're wearing on your back and the surface of the cylinder wall times the size of the normal force on you. Well, if this floor drops, the normal force will not be the normal force of the floor pushing up. This is going to be the normal force of the wall pushing out, or I should say pushing inward on you. It's always pushing inward or towards the center of the circular path that you're following. So uh, if the normal force is big enough, then the frictional force will be big enough to be the same size as gravity, and then you can more or less sit there at rest. But if the normal force is not big enough, friction can't be big enough, and if the floor drops, you're gonna actually slide down. And so if you need a bigger frictional force, that just means you need a larger normal force. And you can get a larger normal force by essentially making the ride spin faster. And so the, the operator will make the ride spin faster and faster and faster until all the riders are traveling at a particular velocity so that their normal forces are big enough so that the frictional force can be big enough. So when they drop the floor, there's a frictional force that's the same size as the force of gravity. Uh, and then they'll just spin like that until the ride is done. The first example problem we're going to look at is going to try to figure out how big is that needed tangential velocity so the rider will be able to stick there when the floor is dropped. So the question reads, if a girl with a mass of 30 kilograms wants to remain at rest on a vertical wall while spinning on an amusement park ride, what tangential velocity must she have? Assume the coefficient of static friction between the rider's clothes and the wall is 0.5 and the radius of the ride is 3.5 meters. So we'll just assume that the center of her mass is approximately three and a half meters from the, the point of rotation that she's going around. So the first step is to find how big the normal force needs to be so that the frictional force is the same size as gravity. Well, let's go back to our friction equation. Remember, the size of the frictional force is equal to the coefficient times the normal force. And if we want the person to stay at rest with friction, we're talking about static friction. So it's the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. Remember, we want the frictional force to be the same size as the force of gravity. And if we have a rider with a mass of 30 kilograms, remember mass times gravitational field strength gives us the gravitational force. 
That means on a 30 kilogram rider, the gravitational force is 300 newtons. So if we want a frictional force that's 300 newtons with a coefficient of static friction of 0.5 newtons, we can solve for the needed size of the normal force. Turns out that this rider would need a normal force at 600 newtons in size. And remember, in this case, when we look at all the forces on the rider, the frictional force and the gravitational force cancel out, so the only force left over is the normal force. So the sum of the forces that's pointed centripetally, or pointed towards the center, has to be 600 newtons in size on that rider. So the last part is figuring out, well, how fast does the rider need to be traveling tangentially, the tangential velocity, so that the sum of the forces is 600 newtons? Well, first we need to make sure we can get the equation we need to solve for the need, needed size of the sum of the forces based on the object's mass, the velocity, and the radius. Now, if you're in AP Physics 1, this equation is not on the AP equation sheet but we have these two equations which we can use to get that equation. So remember, in circular motion, the sum of the forces on an object in circular motion at a constant speed is always pointed towards the center or centripetally. So the sum of the forces is pointed towards the center, so the acceleration will also be pointed towards the center. So we can use Newton's second law, but we also need to use our centripetal acceleration equation which tells us how big the acceleration is on something that's moving in a circular path at a constant speed. So the size of that centripetal acceleration is equal to the square of the velocity, the square of the tangential velocity divided by the radius of curvature that that object is following. So we can set these two equations equal to one another. So we get the sum of the forces on an object that's pointed towards the center or centripetally divided by the mass of that object is equal to the tangential velocity of that object squared divided by the radius of curvature that is following. And if we solve this equation for the sum of the forces, we just get this, that the sum of the forces pointed towards the center on an object in a circular motion at a constant speed is equal to its mass times the square of the velocity divided by the radius. So let's use this equation now and the values that we know to solve for the velocity. So remember, the sum of the forces in this case is just equal to the normal force. That's equal to mv squared over r. So the normal force that we need is 600 newtons. The mass of the rider is 30 kilograms. We're solving for the unknown tangential velocity, don't forget to square that, divided by the radius of curvature she's following, which is about three and a half meters. And if we do some algebra and solve for velocity squared, we get 3.5 meters equals 600 newtons divided by 30 kilograms. To get the velocity, we have to square root each side, and so we get that the velocity is equal to the square root of 70 meters squared over second squared, which is 8.4 meters per second. So if the rider is moving at about 8.4 meters per second, which is about 18 and a half or so miles an hour, then the normal force would be 600 newtons. And if the normal force was 600 newtons, that means the frictional force could be as big as 300 newtons to counteract the gravitational force and the rider would remain at rest. Now let's think through the same exact problem just symbolically. So let's say we didn't know the mass, 30 kilograms, let's just say it's a mass of m and we didn't have the coefficient of friction, let's just say we had the variable for that and the radius is just a radius of r. And so what would be an expression for the needed size of the tangential velocity v? Well, the force of gravity just becomes symbolically just m times g, and we know that the force of friction, we want to be the same size as gravity, so the size of the frictional force will also then just be m times g. So let's go through the same sequence to solve this problem with symbols like we did with numbers in the previous example. So let's first find the needed size of the normal force so that the frictional force is the same size as gravity which we said is equal to m times g. So let's use our friction equation again. And instead of the force of friction, we'll just plug in m times g. That's equal to the coefficient times the size of the normal force. And so if we solve for the normal force, we get that the expression is that the normal force is just equal to m times g divided by the coefficient of static friction. Let's now use our circular motion equation to solve, get an expression for v. Remember that the sum of the forces is just the normal force, 
and we just found an expression for the size of the normal force in terms of m, g, and the coefficient, the given variables. And so we can plug in for the normal force mg divided by the coefficient of static friction, and that's all equal to the mass of the object times its tangential velocity squared divided by the radius of curvature. So we get this expression right here. You can see that we can cancel an m off on either side, just divide each side by m. And so we get the expression, the gravitational field strength divided by the coefficient of static friction is equal to the square of the velocity divided by the radius of curvature. So let's just do, let's multiply each side by r, and we get that the square of the velocity is equal to g times r divided by mu sub s, or the velocity is equal to the square root of gr over mu sub s. So this would be an expression which would give us the needed size of the velocity uh, on any object with any mass for any coefficient of static friction for any radius of curvature. And if you look at our answer, one thing you'll notice is one of the variables that we started with is missing. There's no m in that expression. What that tells us is that in this case, the needed velocity in order for somebody to stay at rest is independent of the rider's mass. That means it doesn't matter what the mass of the person is or all the riders that get on here at the same time, there's one particular velocity that would make everybody stay at rest. This does assume that the coefficient of friction for all the riders closed in the wall are approximately the same. If that's the case, then the velocity for all the riders would also be the same.